Okay, thank you for joining us today for one in a series of three story tours discussing the African American experience in Chesapeake. My name is Wendy and I will be your moderator. Today's story tour is Honor in Battle. Our hosts are Toby Word, Sales Manager for Chesapeake Convention and Visitors Bureau, and Jessica Cosmas, Historical Services Manager for Chesapeake Parks, Recreation and Tourism. Today's presentation and Q&A are being recorded. If you have questions or comments you would like shared, please use the chat feature. Check that your chats are being submitted to the host. All questions and comments will be addressed at the end of the program. For the best presentation experience, we have muted the microphone and turned off video for all users. Be sure to select speaker view on the top right corner of your screen, not gallery. We are proud of the historical treasures we have here and excited to present a few in this format. Thank you for joining us. We are happy to present this programming to you. Our hope is that the stories shared here will help you experience another side of Chesapeake. Most of what will be shared during this series is from early America, the beginning of our country's history. We will be quoting historic documents predominantly from the 18th and 19th century. Some of the words used are reflective of the time when they were written. These words are not commonly used in the 21st century. For this evening's story tour, we will present several stories related to the American Revolutionary War, which occurred from 1775 to 1783 between the Great British Empire and the 13 North American colonies who wished to declare independence from royal British rule. Then we turn to the American Civil War, which took place from 1861 to 1865 between the Union and the Confederates who attempted to secede from the United States of America. We will discuss how these conflicts impacted Chesapeake. Prior to 1963, however, what we currently call Chesapeake was actually known as Norfolk County. If you're planning to research our area, you may want to keep that name change in mind. For the Revolutionary War, we will highlight the Ethiopian Regiment, composed of people of African descent fighting on behalf of the British Empire. We also will discuss William Billy Flora, a young man recognized as a patriot hero of the Battle of Great Bridge, which occurred on December 9, 1775, right here, here in Chesapeake, here. Very nearby. <laughs> yes. <laughs> we will shift forward in time to America's Civil War, to present the United States colored troops and highlight a few individuals who fought with various UCT regiments. <clears throat> the image here lays out the historic Battle of Great Bridge on a modern day map, where you see Fordyce marking the camp of a British captain and his troops is approximately the current location of the Great Bridge Battlefield and Waterways Museum. You know, when I'm in the area for work or to shop or eat, in fact, I ate lunch in Great Bridge. You're making me hungry. Today. <laughs> um, you know, it's amazing. It's really exciting to know that the battle occurred there in the village of Great Bridge. Um, if you're joining us from outside the region, the village of Great Bridge exists today. It's full of history and is a very popular area of Chesapeake. The road that gets you there is Battlefield Boulevard, named for the Revolutionary War Battle of Great Bridge. Let's watch a video about the Ethiopian Regiment. You may want to increase your volume uh, for this portion just to get the best experience uh, with the video. We filmed this feature at Battlefield Park in the village of Great Bridge. Continental Army, freedom, liberty, patriots, redcoats. These are just a few of the words or phrases that may come to mind thinking about the Revolutionary War. 
Do you know about the Ethiopian Regiment? We may not often think about people of color and the Revolutionary War. Once I took a closer look at the details about the Ethiopian Regiment, I was fascinated. For today's tour cast, we're at Battlefield Park. The December 9th, 1775 Battle of Great Bridge took place right in this area. In fact, this landscape is about the same as it would have looked in 1775. So, of course, there were a lot of firsts in the 1700s. The Battle of Great Bridge was no exception. It was the first land battle and first victory for Virginia. Another first was the Ethiopian Regiment. It was formed by John Murray. Named for him, Fort Murray was back there in 1775. Virginia's royal governor, he was the Earl of Dunmore. So he was also known as Lord Dunmore. And like any good historical story, there was drama and lots of it. Dunmore, of course, supported the royal crown and apparently didn't get along too well with leaders in the colonial capital of Williamsburg. I'm sure you remember your elementary school history education and the famous give me liberty or give me death speech by Patrick Henry. Well, that declaration was made in March 1774 when Patrick Henry was a delegate. Well, from what I've read, the declaration was essentially a challenge to Lord Dunmore. By April 1775, Virginia was preparing for war and Lord Dunmore wanted to deny access to ammunition in Williamsburg. Now I'm getting to the part about the Ethiopian Regiment. I promise, I just wanted to give you some background. So after Patrick Henry said what he said, Lord Dunmore had a proclamation of his own. It was officially issued in November, 1775. <clears throat> I do hereby further declare all indented servants, Negroes or others appertaining to rebels, free that are able and willing to bear arms, they joining his majesty's troops as soon as may be for the more speedily reducing this colony to a proper sense of their duty. In other words, any person who's enslaved and leaves their master to fight for the British would be free. Free from slavery, free. I told you there was drama. Men signed up and Dunmore sailed up and down the river on a recruiting mission. He needed to build up British troops and the timing was perfect. This newly formed regiment fought a true battle for the first time at the Battle of Great Bridge. They had an inscription on their breast that said, Liberty to Slaves. Side note, you may have heard of William Billy Flora. He was a black man born free. Because of his bravery and swift action, Billy Flora is recognized as a hero of the Battle of Great Bridge the first land victory of the Revolutionary War in Virginia. Another first, this was the first known instance of the conflict where men of African descent faced each other in a true battle, some fighting for personal freedom, others for the country's liberty. So what happened to the Ethiopian regiment after the Battle of Great Bridge? Apparently, by the time Lord Dunmore abandoned Virginia, Roughly 300 men, women, and children of African descent sailed north with him. About 150 were soldiers. Many fought alongside the British in other skirmishes, mostly in the north. Some joined other troops made up of people of color. Smallpox was also a major issue that led to great loss of life. The historic Ethiopian Regiment was formed in Virginia and fought right here in 1775 in Great Bridge. Fascinating, right? Well, thanks for joining us on today's TourCast. There's always more history to discover.
Well, Toby, thank you for that excellent introduction to the Battle of Great Bridge. Um, just to emphasize some points that, that Toby covered, Virginia's royally appointed governor, Lord Dunmore, depicted in the slide here, ordered British forces to seize all gunpowder from the colonial capital, Williamsburg, in April 1775. This action increased tensions between patriots who challenged British rule and those colonists who wished to remain loyal to the British crown. Lord Dunmore realizing to expand the number of men under his command. He issued a excuse me, proclamation on November 7th, 1775, promising freedom to enslaved individuals who joined his ranks defending the British Empire. As Toby mentioned, Dunmore's Ethiopian regiment saw their first true combat at Great Bridge. Now the village of Great Bridge was located in quite an important spot. It was a marshy area on the southern branch of the Elizabeth River that was narrow enough to accommodate a primitive bridge and road, the only road between the port city of Norfolk and North Carolina. Whoever had control at Great Bridge could control supply lines throughout the lower Tidewater region. On the morning of December 9, 1775, British troops marched south towards Great Bridge where they would meet against Billy Flora and other patriots. William Billy Flora was a person of African descent born free in 1755 in nearby Portsmouth, Virginia. Like many children of his status, he seemed to have little formal schooling. At the age of eight, he apprenticed with Joshua Gammon, a man who transported goods by cart or wagon. Shortly after Flora's birth, 18th birthday in 1773, he enlisted in the Princess Anne County Militia as required by Virginia militia law. When news of the British approaching towards Great Bridge was heard by Flora, he joined the volunteers of the Southern Minutemen Battalion. He was likely assigned to aid in the building of a defensive structure around the village as prescribed by 1748 code that allowed free blacks to quote, march with the militia and do the duty of pioneers or such other servile labor as they shall be directed to perform, end quote. On that day, December 9th, as the British moved down the Great Bridge towards Patriot Earthworks, Flora braved the advancing redcoats to ply, excuse me, pry planks from the bridge and volley musket fire. Flora's actions allowed more time for fellow patriots to mount a response to the British threat. Once the British were within 50 yards of the earthworks, the patriots discharged their weapons, mortally wounding British Captain Fordyce and two of his lieutenants. British troops soon retreated north towards their camp at Fort Murray. By the evening, the British had completely abandoned their post for Norfolk. It is estimated that the British lost between 60 to 100 lives in the battle compared to a single patriot who suffered a mild hand wound. Billy Flora went on to serve throughout the Revolutionary War with several different Virginia regiments, including the 2nd, 5th, 11th, 15th, and 16th. He also served during the decisive Battle of Yorktown. A former commanding officer of Flora described him as, quote, held in high esteem as a soldier, end quote. Pictured here is Billy Flora Way, a street in the village of Great Bridge today. A local business on that road painted a large mural on the exterior of the building as a tribute to Billy Flora and his heroic acts during the 1775 battle. To commemorate the December 9, 1775 Battle of Great Bridge, the city of Chesapeake sponsors a free annual free. Re free. That's a great price. <laughs> free 99. Free 99. Can't beat that. <laughs> um, the city of Chesapeake sponsors a free annual reenactment of the battle during the first weekend in December each year. It's an interactive living history event highlighting the colonial era. The Revolutionary War Battle of Great Bridge is a great uh, source of, of pride in Chesapeake. Uh, the stories of the Ethiopian Regiment, Billy Flora, and other figures in the event are told at the Great Bridge Battlefield and Waterways Museum, 
where you can experience the battle through dynamic exhibits. And it puts you right in the middle of it. It puts you right in the really middle of cool. Cannon, fire, all of it, everywhere. <laughs> it's great. Uh, now, Elizabeth Goodwin, the executive director of the Great Bridge Battlefield and Waterways Museum, will join us to share more about this Chesapeake attraction. Thank you, Toby and Jessica. Uh, the Great Bridge Battlefield and Waterways History Foundation is a nonprofit organization that's dedicated to the preservation and presentation of the historical significance of the Battle of Great Bridge and our waterways. It was formed in 1999 by a group of citizens who wanted to ensure that this history would not be lost. And the foundation went to work raising funds to help build the museum and develop Battlefield Park. Uh, we now operate a museum that opened in June of 2020, and we are open Wednesday through Saturday from 10 to 4, and the second Sunday of the month from 1 to 4. The second Sunday of the month is also Chesapeake Residence Day, so if you happen to be a resident of Chesapeake, you can get in for just $5, and our admission fees are very reasonable. They're $8 for general admission, and we have discounts for seniors, military, and youth as well. Thank you, Elizabeth, so much for joining us this evening. It was great to learn more about the museum and kind of check out the, so the second Sunday that's a Chesapeake Resident Day? The second Sunday, yes. And we have eight galleries in the museum. And as you said, we have a battle room that is wonderful. We have screens on either side and you are literally in the middle of the Battle of Great Bridge. So it's, it's a great museum to come visit. Awesome. Yeah, well, we've gone several times. Yeah, but yeah. You also check it out if you haven't already. <laughs> Thanks, Elizabeth. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we push forward to America's Civil War, beginning in 1861 and ending in 1865. In July of 1862, the United States Congress passed the Militia Act, essentially calling on men of African descent to serve as a military necessity. President Abraham Lincoln signed the legislation on July 17, 1862. A former enslaved man turned famous abolitionist, Frederick Douglass, who has a birthday coming up. That's right. Yeah, February That's 14th. Right. February, That's right, Valentine's Day. Yes. Uh, Frederick Douglass and President Lincoln had a historic meeting in 1863. Mr. Douglass advised the president to officially engage Black soldiers for the Union cause. This meeting was likely instrumental in the formation of the United States Colored Troops. By May of 1863, the first official all-Black regiment was formed. Approximately 180,000 Black men served as USDT in the Union Army. By the end of America's Civil War, a total of 25 Medals of Honor were awarded to Black soldiers and sailors. Black women were not permitted to join the Union Army as soldiers. However, many Black women, like Harriet Tubman, bravely served as spies, scouts, and nurses. The Unknown and Known Afro-Union Civil War Soldiers Memorial is in the Bells Mill community of Chesapeake. The memorial honors 13 USCT soldiers with marble and granite markers that list full name, dates of birth and death, rank and company. The site also includes a private family cemetery with approximately 80 graves dated from 1872 to 2005. One memorial marker is for Sergeant Miles James. James fought honorably during the Battle of New Market Heights also referred to as Chaffin's Farm, near Richmond, Virginia. This battle was fought on September 29, 1864. It was significant because Union General Benjamin Butler chose USCT regiments to lead the battle. Sergeant Miles James was one of 16 USCT soldiers to receive the Medal of Honor during the Civil War. Um, but I'd like to point out that during, there were 16 total uh, during the Civil War, but 14 of those were from that battle at New Market Heights. So there were a lot, you know, that battle was led by the USCT uh, regiments. So uh, this is a citation um, regarding Sergeant Miles James and his award 
uh, of the, uh, the Medal of Honor, dated October 11, 1864. General Butler wrote, quote, Corporal Miles James, 36 U.S. Colored Troops, after having his arm so badly mutilated that immediate amputation was necessary, loaded and discharged his piece with one hand and urged his men forward, this within 30 yards of the enemy's works. He has a medal and a sergeant's warrant. So he had been a corporal, but he became a sergeant, end quote. In 2009, the Civil War Trust listed New Market Heights as one of America's most endangered battlefields. Interred at this site is Sergeant March Corpru. He enlisted in the Army as a member of Company L, 2nd USCT Cavalry Regiment, which means he rode horses. After bravely fighting in numerous battles, he achieved the rank of sergeant. He later returned to his native Virginia and became an influential community member. He effectively established the Bells Mill neighborhood when he settled his family in that area. The land that would become the memorial and cemetery was purchased in 1872 by Sergeant Corpru. He was a strong believer in education. He also donated like donated land for the first colored school in the Bells Mills area, and that was built in 1923. Chesapeake resident, author, and historian Dr. E. Curtis Alexander is responsible for this historical treasure here in Chesapeake. He has traditionally held events at the site on Memorial Day and Veterans Day, which I believe you've attended before. Correct? Absolutely. It's very nice. Very nice. He's there in um, a uniform that reflects the period and the honors uh, those that are memorialized. It's a beautiful event when he's had them in the past. It's been very nice. And it's very special because Dr. Alexander himself is the great grandson of Sergeant March Corporal. The names here list USCT soldiers buried in the Northwest Annex Bethel Baptist Church Cemetery in Chesapeake. This small plot consists of approximately 18 graves. Some markers indicate soldiers that mustered with a New York regiment. One was an undercook. Other markers are simple wooden crosses painted white with a small American flag inserted at the top. One man buried here, Louis DeFord, is affiliated with Company E, the 10th Regiment of USCT. This branch was organized in Virginia, I believe it was Craney Island, on November 18, 1863. We believe this group was present at the Battle of Plymouth in North Carolina in April 1864. This battle was really impactful because it resulted in Confederate trade and military transportation routes to run along the Roanoke River um, after several years under Union blockades. Um, in the aftermath of the battle, Confederate troops began to target and kill up to hundreds of Black Union troops, fugitive slaves, and freeborn Blacks. A surviving USCT soldier, Samuel Johnson, testified to the violence after escaping from Plymouth. Um, it's really incredible um, to know that Private DeFord was able to survive such a brutal episode of the American Civil War. Cuffeytown, also known as Long Ridge, was established in the 1700s. The community uh, was established by free people of African descent. Today, a historic community cemetery is near the Gabriel Chapel AME Zion Church property. The cemetery is the final resting place for 13 USCT members and commonly known as the Cuffey Town 13. The 1870 federal census records indicate that the Cuffey Town 13 may have stayed close to their birthplace following the Civil War possibly returning to the work they did before the war. Most were listed in the federal census as farmers or laborers before the war and similarly listed in census records after the war. Family names of the interred include Cuffey, Smith, Thomas, and Sevels. 
Many of these families reside in Cuffeytown, Long Ridge, to this day. In November 2007, the Buffalo Soldiers Motorcycle Club of Hampton Roads sponsored the dedication of a flagpole at the Cuffeytown Historic Cemetery. The dedication was the first time the American flag waved high above this hallowed ground. One Civil War veteran buried uh, at this cemetery is Corporal Lemuel Cuffey. Records point towards a serious injury during his service, and he was transferred several times to various military hospitals before being discharged from service on disability in December 1864. He goes on to collect pension totaling $30.20. That's his pension. It's really incredible to, to see in the census records how they returned. I think that really speaks to how strong and close knit the Cubbytown community was um, yes. that they would return after, you know, something as um, tragic and um, all encompassing as the Civil War, that they returned back to the community that, that raised them. Absolutely. And they served in multiple, um, you know, battles, um, not just those in Virginia. So absolutely. It was a strong, strong community in Cuffeytown. Some people refer to it as Cuffeytown, some refer to it as Long Ridge, um, but it is really a, um, a very strong and solid community. And we spoke about that community in our our last webinar. Right. Um, if, if you haven't checked that out, I think Wendy um, will give you some more information on how to, to see that webinar. Mm -hmm. Next, we will watch an exciting video featuring the United States Colored Troops Ensemble. At one time, this group performed songs that reflected the USCT's Civil War experience. The song that we will hear was supposedly created by the 54th Massachusetts United States Colored Troops Regiment. The movie Glory starring Denzel Washington, I think Matthew Broderick. Okay. I, I remember Denzel. <laughs> I remember Denzel. That's all you do now. Paid tribute uh, to this regiment. We look like men. We look like men. We look like men of war, an army dressed in uniform. We look like men of war. Oh, listen to the trumpet sound. They call for volunteers. King Jesus stands on common ground, and we shall have no fear. Before we open it up to questions, we would like to take a moment to acknowledge the individuals and organizations that contributed to this program. Thank you to the Great Bridge Battlefield and Waterways, Waterways Museum, Norfolk County Historical Society, Dr. E. Curtis Alexander, curator and founder of the Unknown and Known Afro Union Civil War Soldiers Memorial, Ms. Anita Harrell of the Wamanoke Association on behalf of the United States Colored Troops Ensemble, and the City of Hampton's Round Robin TV show. We hope our presentation this evening has been informative. Men of African descent honorably served in multiple battles that were critical to the formation and development of our country. Now, we welcome your questions. Okay. Um, we do have um, a couple of questions. The first one says, what have archeologists found at the battlefield of Great Bridge? Uh, that's a, a great question. Elizabeth, do you feel comfortable taking that on? Sure, I can take that on. Um, we had, uh, when the bridge was reconstructed in 2004, there were 
um, members of our foundation who are allowed to sift through excavated material. And um, they found mostly pieces of pottery, uh, glass, wine bottles, and uh, they were taken and identified and uh, preserved. And they most of those are on display in the museum. So a lot of pieces of pottery, um, wine glasses, I think I said that already, and um, some Westerwald pieces, which is a, another type of pottery uh, that was popular in the 18th century. That's awesome. Yeah. <laughs> All right, let's see. Um, I have a question regarding when were Black women able to enlist in the military? I know the answer to that. Um, I 1940, I believe it was around 1940, the War Department had mandated like the equal treatment of troops um, regardless of race. And I believe it was 1942 allowed Black women to enlist. It was a Women's Auxiliary Corps, WAC. Um, and it was the army uh, that was the first to open its, this new female corps um, to black women. So 19, I'm pretty sure it was 1942. Thank you for the question. Uh, let's see, the next question is, were the USCT, let's see, oh, here's one. Uh, were black women allowed to support the black units in the civil war? Absolutely, yes. Um, in fact, I, I, I have a book. Um, <laughs> Susan, oh my goodness, and I should know because it's, I think, I don't want to say her last name, but I know the first name is Susan. Um, she served with a regiment, I believe it was South Carolina. I have this book in my office. Um, she wrote a book um, and she's believed to be the only Black woman that um, served um, or was part of the Civil War um, to have written a book of her experience. And I, gosh, if I knew that question was coming, I would have had the book <laughs> in here this evening. But, um, but yes, you know, and we, we talked briefly about that, but, you know, um, and these are aspects I think of these probably both the 18th and 19th century battles, you kind of don't always think about, you know, we of course think of the, the men, um, and of course later women who serve honorably in uniform, um, but thinking of the 19th century, you know, laundresses and um, cooks, we mm -hmm. have, have a story about at the Northwest Annex, yeah. um, there's a, um, a grave there um, of one woman um, who, who it said, I believe it says there on the marker, was a cook, undercook. Mm -hmm. Patty. Um, Patty, that's right. And so for sure, um, nurses, um, um, you know, absolutely. Um, were they, with the USAT, were they officially part of these USA, yes, excuse me, USCT troops? I don't believe so. Um, but things that I've read um, and books like this um, uh, that Susan wrote, um, you know, speak to that type of work, you know, laundry, being a laundress and um, nurse, cook. Um, so black women were, were, were there and serving um, in another way. Um, I think often in, you know, these kinds of support, support roles, so. Great question. Anything? No, I, I think you did a great job. Oh, well, thanks. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. All right. Uh, the next question is the $30 pension mentioned, was that the usual amount for that time or was that a much smaller payment made to the colored regimen compared to their white counterparts? I, I want to say it's safe to assume that that was a lower payment. Um, for sure. Um, I have not kind of researched that in depth, um, but based on the things that I have learned about the USCT, USCT um, yes, it's safe to say they were absolutely not paid the same as their, their white counterparts. I can't speak to the average um, amount of pay 
Um, I just really haven't done that research, frankly, and I, I don't want to uh, give false information. Um, but um, the, the Virginia Department of Historic Resources is a really great area, a site um, to kind of see some of that information. Um, but like I said, I haven't done any in-depth research to be able to answer the question more um, with more detail, but I hope that helps. <laughs> well, and there's also um, the following the war, the Bureau of Freedmen was established mm -hmm. and part of their duty was um, looking through pension applications um, and permitting or denying, because I know um, some individuals that I've come across in research, you know, they they have to have um, people that they fought with or people in their community, like neighbors, kind of um, vouch. vouch for, you know, what, what they were like before and after the war. And if they um, incurred any, you know, bodily harm that could make them no longer able to to be a laborer or a farmer in the same capacity that they were before the war, um, you know, those applications and seeing where they're denied. Um, I believe through, if you have a Chesapeake Public Library card, um, you can access ancestry.com and they have a lot of those um, different files digitized um, and you can search um, by area. So in this, in this instance, you would, you would search for Norfolk um, and you, you can find some really interesting information starting to, to dig into those records. Um, but more of that information is coming, um, widely of, available. So you don't even have to leave your home. You know, you can search at the library, um, or search at home. Um, so you can find out more. And awesome. I'm intrigued by the question, actually. I think I want to go back and do, do some more research to learn learn even more about that, about the pay, because that's a really, it's a good question. And I think it's also uh, worth mentioning that a lot of times these USCT troops were full of um, people of African descent, but they usually had white commanding officers. Absolutely. That's um, right. So that's something else um, as far as what the federal position was on rank um, and pay, um, there was seeming a, a limit on how far, um, despite someone's record um, of valor, how far someone could rise up in, in the ranks at that time. At that time, that's right. And, you know, I mean, people of African descent in this country were um, not legally citizens until 1868, you know, so I, I'm, that may play into the, so another, another layer another layer of um, consideration mm -hmm. for um, what they what they endured. Awesome. Um, I have one more question so far. Uh, were the men of the Ethiopian regiment from Ethiopia in North Africa? Oh, that's a great question. Um, I think it's safe to say they were likely not from Ethiopia. I have not done the research on that. Um, you know, um, I, I think, you know, Ethiopia is in North Africa and they're just may, there may have been some association that Lord Dunmore had with that country. Um, I have not seen anything that indicated that they were from Ethiopia. So I think it was more just a, you know, the name of an African country that he decided to assign to the to the regiment. Um, but that's that's really just based on my own assumption. I haven't seen anything that said they were necessarily from that country. Okay. And were the Ethiopians granted freedom and moved to England? Oh, do you want to address that? Oh, so um, actually a lot of uh, Ethiopian regiment families actually ended up in Nova Scotia. That's right. Of all That's places. Right. Um, yeah, um, so, you know, in, in Canada. Um, so they didn't necessarily um, go to England proper, um, but there, there's um, 
documentation that a lot of those um, those who were enlisted and their families ended up settling in, in Nova Scotia. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I know I read some things that talked about, you know, after I believe the the regiment would have um, the the name, the Ethiopian regiment would have um, been disbanded by Lord Dunmore in 1776, so not far, not long after the Battle of Great Bridge. But many of those soldiers um, made their way north. Um, some fought in a regiment, I believe in New York, uh, they became known as, I think it was like the Black Pioneers, it's kind of another name um, for them. Um, New York and some Rhode Island, there's a lot of history with the um, uh, black, some black regiments in, in Rhode Island um, as well, following the, um, the Revolutionary War. So yeah, I think to Jessica's point, you know, kind of heading north and many made their way to Nova Scotia, um, but I've not seen anything that talked about, um, you know, going, um, going to England. Or anything like that but yeah great question mm -hmm. all right and i think uh our last question why was great bridge an area of importance during the revolutionary war so we have to think that great bridge looked very different um than what we recognize now as as great bridge mm -hmm. um but really it was just kind of a a central point um for a lot of uh, transportation, right. um, the Great Road um, and Great Bridge in Great Bridge, Great Bridge it, like one one, road. and it was really kind of the only road. It's um, crazy to think of. Yeah, um, but you have to think also the the Great Dismal Swamp. Um, the size that it is now mm -hmm. is is much smaller than it was originally. Mm -hmm. So you have to think about all of this swampy marsh. Uh, land full of trees and undergrowth and you know bears and panthers um, oh my yeah exactly <laughs> um and great bridge was kind of the the one relatively safe uh passage um from this area into to north carolina i don't know if elizabeth is is still um with us if she wants to add anything to that that point Sure. Um, it, well, it was the only land route from Northeast North Carolina to Norfolk and to get your goods and products to port, you had to cross the Great Road in Great Bridge. And uh, if you think of the agricultural rich soil that we have in Southeastern Chesapeake and in Northeastern North Carolina, uh, all of those, those products, food, uh, had to be transported through Great Bridge to get to port in Norfolk. So that's why it was so strategic. Whoever controlled the bridge controlled commerce. So both sides wanted to control that bridge. And uh, that's why the Battle of Great Bridge took place. It was all about the water. Interesting. I mean, I've seen some things too that talked about the storage, like of the military supplies um, and that, that was so important, you know, for um, General Washington, George Washington, um, to, you know, to kind of protect. It was a, 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 a place to store um, the military. But that, and that also made me think about some things you shared tonight, Jessica, with the um, that battle at Plymouth. You mm -hmm. kind of said some similar things about the importance of the waterway. You right. Know, so I, as you were sharing that, I said, gosh, you know, sort of 100 years later, the, those kinds of issues, you know, it's when you think about the, I guess, geography and topography mm -hmm. and um, how all that kind of plays out or impacts these battles and why they're trying to get a, a stronghold in a certain place. You know, that's, um, those are, I guess, it's part of the story. Yeah, that's a great point. Thanks, Elizabeth. Awesome. All right, well, I think that is all of our questions. Um, I want to thank you for joining us today for Story Tour of Chesapeake, Virginia, Honor in Battle. If you haven't already, be sure to sign up for the last of the story tours in our series, The Great Dismal Swamp, on February 15th. You will find information on these webinars and more at our website, 
www.visitchesapeake.com slash AACR. And I have dropped that uh, link into the chat for you. You will also be able to access the recorded version of this webinar series here. So if you missed the first in our series, Preaching and Teaching, Legacies in Church and Education, you will be able to access the recording on this website. If you live locally, be sure to stop into our visitor center and gift shop at 1224 Progressive Drive. We offer an assortment of Chesapeake items along with books covering some of the topics in this series. Thank you again for joining us and enjoy the rest of your evening. Bye, thank you. Bye, thank you.